Chapter eighteen of Concerning Isabel Carnaby. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Concerning Isabel Carnaby by Ellen Thornycroft Fowler. Chapter eighteen A State Concert rank and wealth i pass unheeding never giving them their due for my heart and soul are needing nothing in the world but you as i have often remarked said isabel one hot june morning as she and lady farley were sitting together in the latter's boudoir the world as the world has nothing better to offer than a state concert i agree with you replied her aunt it combines the charms of a religious service and a smart party and has the advantages of both with the disadvantages of neither the music is always good so are the dresses and the diamonds and the palace is the coolest place in london quite true said lady farley and what more can the heart and flesh of fashionable woman desire several things for instance my cup of happiness will not overflow till i have a diamond tiara now there you have the advantage of me but you cannot have a tiara without having a husband as well and there you have the advantage of me i shall not have the advantage of you long and isabel laughed no but you will then have the tiara in place of the advantage one of my chief reasons in getting married is to secure to myself the right of wearing a tiara remarked isabel i consider that a woman of thirty without a tiara is as indecent as a woman of ninety without a cap women must be crowned with either youth or diamonds or else must hide their diminished heads under the cloak of religion and retire into nunneries and sisterhoods my dear you are too sarcastic for so young a person no unmarried woman should ever say nasty things unless she is a professional beauty still i hope you will enjoy the concert to-night in spite of the shame of your uncovered head i am thankful it is a concert and not a ball if it were a ball i should have to talk to wrexham all evening but now i can keep silence and let the dear man feast his eyes upon the beauties of my irregular profile instead of feasting his ears upon the charms of my still more irregular conversation then poor wrexham will come badly off to-night said lady farley for your conversation is infinitely superior to your profile my dear i know it is but i wish you would not tread upon my toes or more correctly upon my nose so ruthlessly it is simply fiendish to throw a woman's nose in her teeth in that fashion poor isabel i always envy the women with good noses more than i can express continued miss carnaby leaning back in her chair and gazing thoughtfully up to the ceiling eyes grow dim and teeth depart and figures increase but a good nose is an abiding resting-place for your vanity you know that it will last out your time whatever happens and that age cannot wither nor custom stale its satisfactory proportions that is so agreed lady farley tenderly stroking her own perfect little aquiline i always wonder how the women with pretty noses carry on their advertising department of course when we have good eyes we call attention to the same by making use of eye service as men pleasers so to speak and when we have good teeth we smile as often as is compatible with the reputation for sanity and we frequently complain of the toothache oh is that your plan of campaign i have often wondered how teeth as white as yours are can ache as much as you say they do but now i understand it is only a ruse 
you misjudge me there aunt caroline i know my teeth are pretty but they are merely little devils disguised as angels of light for i have inherited an estate of fine and extensive acres but you haven't yet informed me how the well-nosed women call attention to their stock in trade my dear when a thing is as plain as the nose on your face it does not require any advertisement according to proverbial philosophy it is not when it is plain that the necessity arises continued isabel but only when it is pretty how absurd you are do you talk to lord wrexham like this good gracious no he would think i was out of my mind and would recommend some new german baths or other which the faculty had discovered as the latest cure for insanity and then he would carefully explain to me the chemical action of the waters upon the tissue of the human brain you really are too bad isabel said lady farley severely lord wrexham is a peer and one of the best matches in london and yet you treat him as badly as if you were marrying him for love it is very incorrect and improvident of you isabel opened her blue eyes very wide you don't have to make love to him for three hours and more at a stretch or you would not talk about him in that careless and happy way i confess that the excellent man's wealth and rank and virtue are unequalled save perhaps by his dullness but believe me there is only one thing on earth more fatiguing than talking to wrexham and that is listening to him take this as a wrinkle from one who knows you should adapt yourself to him my dear it does not do for a man to know that a woman is cleverer than he is he doesn't know it i do but i have never let him find it out and as for adapting myself why my dear aunt if you heard me talk to him you would take me for a land agent or a farm labourer hardly said lady farley who was lazily looking through her list of engagements for the day yes you would personally i prefer talking about hearts and souls and ideals to discussing silos and reaping machines and land bills but wrexham dotes upon the latter so on the latter does my nimble tongue run adaptability is my strong point don't you know and your weak point too my child you are so exactly what people want you to be that nobody knows what the real you is like ah but i know more's the pity then you know more than i do yes i am wonderfully adaptable in fact i have reduced adaptability to a science i always make myself five years younger and one degree less intelligent than the man who takes me in to dinner that is why i am so popular it is the popular women who make shipwreck of their lives and the unpopular ones who sail safely into pleasant havens my experience is that the attractive women get the nice little things and the unattractive ones the nice big things in this world and lady farley sighed as she sat down to answer invitations i know said isabel rising from her chair and strolling doorwards the latter out of sheer gratitude marry the first man that asks them and spend the rest of their lives in returning thanks for his kind inquiry that night isabel went with her uncle and aunt to the state concert the scene was as brilliant as usual with the gay dresses and uniforms with the dais for royalty at one end of the great saloon and the musicians gallery at the other the intervening space being filled up with the cream of english society i say cried lord robert thistletown plumping himself down beside them as soon as they had taken their seats there will be a sound of revelry this night without a doubt for i see a chorus out of one of old wagner's things down on the programme and he is the best chap for making a row i ever came across you should not speak disrespectfully of wagner corrected isabel he is one of the greatest composers as i am one of the greatest conversationalists of the age
i am not disrespectful i only think that compared with you and wagner the rest of the world is silence i see it is the chorus of flower maidens out of parsifal remarked isabel i suppose all those young women in white are the maidens but which are the flowers i wonder yourself my dear young friend you are the flower of the english aristocracy don't you know of course i am yet sometimes i forget that i am a flower and behave like a stinging nettle that is when the brilliancy of my wit outruns the benevolence of my heart if you lightly touch a nettle isabel began exactly so you have hit the nail on the head most wise young woman it is only when you trifle with me that i become dangerous grasp me like a man of metal and you will find that the tighter you squeeze me the more affectionate shall i become i wonder if a man of metal means a warrior or an iron master remarked isabel it entirely depends upon how you spell the word and that again depends upon which type of man you prefer to grasp so it is all a matter of taste how absurd you are don't the little boys out of the chapel royal choir look dear exclaimed lord robert pointing to the orchestra it is a sweet dress i mean to sing in the choir of the chapel royal when i am going up because the dress is so peculiarly becoming to my style of beauty it would be i should say and you are just the right size for it only about six foot two exactly scarlet is my colour i was always bent on wearing a scarlet uniform but i have gone through agonies of indecision as to whether i should attain that end through joining the british army or the choir of the chapel royal i decided on the former and made a mistake and a mistake is worse than a crime and only one degree better than a virtue then what is your reason for resigning the army in favour of the st james's choir asked isabel opening her huge feather fan merely this that whenever i am called upon to fight or to sing i invariably run away and my friends consider that what is a sign of cowardice in the one case becomes an act of public charity in the other and that therefore the choir is my true vocation and calling i should like to hear you sing pardon me you wouldn't replied lord bobby when i overcome my natural diffidence and give tongue the noise is something tremendous walls tremble foundations shake and roofs are carried bodily away one day a traveller in passing through our place asked if there had been a whirlwind or an earthquake or a siege the devastation was so appalling but he was told that there had only been a village concert the night before and my lordship had sung a couple of comic songs it must be a terrible sound it is that is why i so rarely do it as shakespeare or milton or some other old johnny remarked it is all very well to have a giant's strength but to use it as a giant is simply beastly isn't it a brilliant scene said isabel i love to see the stars and garters and things don't you they are awfully jolly don't you think an order would suit me then with my bath upon my shoulder and my garter by my side i'd be taking some great heiress and be making her my bride has your uncle got his ribbon on of course he always takes his bath when he goes to grand parties replied isabel how nice and clean of him and that reminds me that my mother was overhauling the school children the other day down at our place at home and telling them that dirt was very wrong and very unwholesome but please your ladyship piped up a little chap it's very warm wasn't that quite too nice delicious oh look at the bishops don't they look dear simply sweet just like lovely purple saintly footmen agreed bobby i never saw a saintly footman but i did we had one once he had conscientious scruples against saying not at home and laying the wine glasses for dinner we bore with that for a long time because he was six foot three and very good-looking but finally it developed into socialism and he wanted to call the governor wallingford and my mother augusta then he had to go and mother made a rule that for the future the footmen 
might keep bicycles on condition that they did not want to keep consciences as well what nonsense you do talk bobby i know i do it is my greatest charm but here comes wrexham so i must resign my seat in his favour as if he were a party leader it must be funny to be engaged and always obliged to sit by the same person isabel gently fanned herself i love variety continued bobby and i hate having to take the same woman down to dinner twice in the same season that is one good thing in getting married you know then that whatever happens there is one woman you will never have to take into dinner again as long as you live it is this thought alone which has inspired the majority of proposals that i have already made and then bobby flew off to fresh woods and pastures new while lord wrexham sat down beside isabel and began to talk to her in his gently instructive manner isabel was wrong when she said that her lover had no idea that he bored her it may be easy for a woman to throw dust in the eyes of the men who only admire her but the men who love her see too clearly to be blinded by any paltry artifice and frequently suffer accordingly lord wrexham knew that he bored isabel and the knowledge well nigh broke his heart but he could no more help boring her than he could help breathing he made mistakes in his dealings with her and frequently said the wrong thing therefore isabel was hard upon him friendship may pardon our misdeeds but it is only love that can forgive our mistakes nevertheless isabel's lover succeeded in making her think that he thought she did not think him stupid wherein he showed himself the cleverer of the two isn't the room delightfully cool remarked isabel it is the system of ventilation here is admirable i wish i could introduce it at vernacre vernacre is perfect as it is said miss carnaby graciously so please don't begin to improve it i am a good liberal and experience has taught me that there is nothing so deteriorating in its influence as improvement nor so retrogressive in its tendency as reform you are joking replied lord wrexham kindly explaining to isabel that she did not mean what she said of course it is true that a too abrupt or sudden improvement partakes more of the nature of revolution than of reform but a slow and steady tendency in a progressive direction is the only healthy condition for a state as for an individual nevertheless i have noticed that reform generally means discomfort and that ventilation invariably means draughts proper ventilation ought not however to mean draughts it should change the air imperceptibly without causing a strong current anywhere but you don't feel a draught here do you dear inquired his lordship anxiously looking up at the high windows because if so i will find you another seat at once good gracious no how could i on such a broiling night i should think that even the ministers are warm enough now are they not generally not in their war-paint bald heads and silk stockings are very chilly wear it is like burning the candle at both ends or rather at neither as candles are warm instead of cold of course you were always right replied isabel accepting the correction in the letter but not in the spirit of meekness this room really is a lovely sight isn't it she was wondering how soon the royalties would arrive it is its proportions are so fine that it never strikes one as large or small agreed her lover oh i don't mean that it is a fine sight Arch architecturally i mean the company looks so smart everybody is here that is to say everybody who is anybody well not quite everybody you are a little inaccurate my dear some people are asked to the second concert and the first ball instead of to the first concert and the second ball as we have been explained lord wrexham i do not know how the lord chamberlain picks and chooses but there is no advantage of one over the other 
i expect they divide the people alphabetically observed isabel absently looking towards the entrance at the upper end of the room i expect so that is always a most satisfactory plan in lists of any kind but no he continued looking puzzled that cannot be the system because i am invited to the first concert and my name begins with a w but there is no reason that i can see why the alphabet should not begin at w and end at v for a change instead of the old eternal a and z system said isabel wickedly lord wrexham appeared more puzzled than ever it would be most unusual and i do not see that any advantage would be gained thereby it would be a reform and that is always a distinct advantage don't you know lord wrexham's face relaxed ah now i see you are laughing at me he said pleasantly and after a moment's meditation he began to laugh himself that was very funny isabel very funny indeed to begin the alphabet at w by way of a reform capital capital and as you say my dear quite as sensible as many reforms that are suggested hush whispered isabel they are coming and then that silence fell upon everybody which always falls just before something is going to happen be that something the advent of a royal procession or only the more everyday occurrence of dawn the officers of the household entered walking backwards and all the company rose to their feet as the orchestra struck up the national anthem finally the royalties themselves appeared and bowed to their assembled guests while the ladies curtsied in response till the room looked like a cornfield when a summer breeze goes by when everybody was seated isabel whispered to lord wrexham i do love anything in the shape of a function it gives me a thrill all down my back do you ever have thrills down your back lord wrexham considered for a moment he never answered a question hurriedly lest he should thereby be led into inaccuracy no i cannot say that i ever do unless i am suffering from the effects of a chill then there must be something wrong with your back if god save the queen does not send a thrill all down it i would consult a spine doctor if i were you a bacteriologist i suppose one would call him if you feel a sensation of that kind now i feel sure you must be sitting in a draught i can account for it in no other way said lord wrexham his kind face clouded over with lover-like anxiety nonsense replied isabel rather sharply what i feel is no draught but a deeply rooted human instinct which cries out for functions both in church and state and that instinct will have to be eradicated before all forms of royalty and ritualism can be abolished from this best of all possible worlds it takes a strong government to disestablish an instinct i cannot quite follow you dear you go too quickly for a slow old coach like myself and i am mentally out of breath with trying to keep up with you what connection can a draft down one's back have with established methods of worship and government never mind about following me i am not worth the trouble and we must not talk any more the music is beginning after the music began strange and disturbing thoughts whirled through isabel's mind whether it was because the beauty of sight and sound stimulated her emotional nature she could not tell but the old aching hunger for paul which she had succeeded in stifling for so long woke up and would not be put to silence she looked at the gorgeous scene around her and realized that the world had given her of its best she had bartered her heart and her soul for its glory and honour and the price had been paid her to the uttermost farthing she had nothing to complain of on that score and she was too clever and experienced a woman to call the triumph she had accomplished dust and ashes it was a good enough thing in its way only it was not paul and paul unfortunately 
was the only thing that she cared for it is absurd to call worldly success worthless because it does not happen to be the precise thing that we personally desire just as it would be absurd to call roast beef uneatable when we happen to be thirsty rather than hungry but we want what we want and not what is suitable or convenient or wise and nothing else in the whole world will satisfy us it is one of the saddest if not one of the most comforting things in life that when people have caught a glimpse of the best the second best can never again content them if they have once be it only for a moment worn the best robe and sat down to the feast they will never more really enjoy the husks of the far country even though the citizens of that country prepare the same with their most delicate arts and serve them up on gold plate unwise men do not consider this and fools do not understand it so that the former find out too late that their souls must be starved to death for lack of that better thing which they once so carelessly threw away while the latter enjoy their husky diet in peace unknowing that there is any better thing at all isabel carnaby belonged to the former class she was wise enough to recognize the best when she saw it and foolish enough having seen it to let it go she might have been a happy woman had she had more heart or less but now such as she had was breaking suddenly the veil which she had so carefully draped in front of her inner life was ruthlessly torn away and the ideal self whom she thought she had slain woke up in the renewed strength of a long slumber and she knew that she loved paul as she had loved him in the beginning and as she would love him to the end and that no other man could ever supplant him in her love or in her life she could have laughed aloud at the grim irony of the thing as she realized that the brilliant scene around her with its perfection of everything that civilization has to offer was as nothing in her eyes in comparison with a quaint little chapel in an old-fashioned country town where she and paul once stood side by side and sang a hymn together how these people would laugh at me she said to herself if they knew that i would gladly give up all the best music of the finest orchestras in london to hear once more there is a land of pure delight sung in a methodist chapel but all the same i would when the concert was over and they went into the supper-room isabel was strangely quiet and subdued which convinced lord wrexham more forcibly than ever that she had been sitting in a draught and would be ill next day my dear i wish you had a little wrap with you he said to put on when you walk along the corridors and through the drawing-rooms well i haven't replied isabel i am so fond of giving little raps to my friends that i don't keep any myself which perhaps is too altruistic on my part when they had had supper and were leaving the palace lord robert thistletown drew isabel on one side i only just want to say good-bye to you he said and she saw to her surprise that his usually rosy face was very white why wherever are you going to bobby that you should say good-bye instead of good-night 
i am starting with my regiment for india to-morrow there is some nasty fighting out there don't you know and we are ordered to the front oh bobby of course it is a piece of awfully good luck for me to see active service so soon and i should be wild with delight if it wasn't for violet but somehow the things you want always seem to come to you just as soon as you've left off wanting them have you spoken to violet asked isabel i did not mean to i thought it was more honourable to leave her free till i came back and all that sort of thing but i went to say good-bye to her to-day and it somehow popped out without my intending it i am afraid i was rather a selfish brute to tell her considering how young she is but she looked so pretty i could not help it and bobby tugged at his moustache regretfully don't regret it said isabel earnestly men have an idiotic notion that it is the proper thing to keep a woman in ignorance of the fact that they love her till they are ready with the marriage settlements it never appears to occur to them that to her the settlements are of no importance compared with the love and i'm so poor that when we get to the settlements they'll only be straight settlements replied bobby with a rueful attempt to laugh never mind that always remember that to a man love-making is the prologue to marriage but to a woman marriage is the epilogue to making love then good-bye whispered lord bobby squeezing her hand very tight and manfully swallowing down a silly lump that would come in his throat and if i am potted by the niggers you'll comfort my little girl won't you and teach her to forget isabel's eyes filled with tears my dear boy i cannot teach her that for i have not learnt it myself it is an art never mastered by women but i will teach her that there is really no such thing as forgetfulness just as there is really no such thing as death End of chapter eighteen chapter nineteen of concerning isabel carnby this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c concerning isabel carnby by ellen thornycroft fowler chapter nineteen among the wounded there were many who strove in the battle of life who shared in the struggle and joined in the strife and fought to their utmost breath but some stood aside while the battle rolled by and lifted to heaven an agonized cry we are wounded they said to the death rexham said isabel to her lover the next day as they were sitting in the drawing-room in prince's gate i am going to make you unhappy but i cannot help it lord wrexham's face grew anxious i know what it is you caught cold last night and you fear you are going to be ill i was afraid there was a draught all the time no it isn't that it is something much worse replied isabel gently she was very patient with wrexham now then tell me the worst at once i cannot bear suspense where you are concerned please don't mind very much dear said isabel laying her hand caressingly on his coat sleeve but i cannot marry you lord wrexham turned very white cannot marry me whatever do you mean i mean that i have been deceiving myself all along and that i do not really love you though i admire and esteem and respect you with all my heart 
but my dearest i never for a moment supposed that you did love me i used sometimes to pretend to myself that you did because it made me so happy but i really knew all the time that it was absurd to expect a brilliant and attractive woman like you to fall in love with such a stupid old fellow as i am i only asked to be allowed to love you and i asked that still but it isn't fair to take the best that you have to offer and only to give you scraps in return cried isabel i am the best judge of that and surely if i am content it is all right but it isn't all right wrexham i love someone else lord wrexham shaded his face with his hand well was all he said but the voice in which said it was not his own isabel's eyes were full of pity as she looked at him i will be candid with you at last she said but please remember that it was myself i was deceiving and not you even i could not sink so low as to wilfully deceive such a good man as you are my dear do not excuse yourself to me remember that whatever you do or leave undone i shall never blame you nor allow any one else to do so my queen cannot do wrong i was angry with paul seaton because i thought he had ceased to love me continued isabel hurriedly i had no right to think so but i got the idea in my head and it would not go and i was so wild with anger and misery that i said hard and cruel things to him that can never be forgiven and i drove him out of my life and pretended that i did not mind my poor wayward petulant child and then i persuaded myself that i did not care for the deeper things of life but could be happy with money and rank and pleasure and such trifles as these and people flattered me and admired me and i thought that i was content and that my love for paul had been only a girlish fancy lord wrexham drew his breath hard but he did not speak but after a time i found myself growing hard and bitter and i knew my youth was going and that i had nothing to show for it and then you came by and offered me everything that society counts worth having i was a woman of the world and i knew that if i became lady wrexham my apparent failure would be changed into a glorious success so i accepted you i see yet i was not altogether base isabel went on i love you in a restful prosaic kind of way and i thought that would be enough and that the sort of love i had given to paul was a dream of the past which i could never dream again but i was wrong my love for paul seaton is no half-forgotten vision but the strongest thing in me and i cannot marry any other man my darling i quite understand said lord wrexham it was only natural that a dull man like myself should fail to win your love you could not help it any more than i could so we are neither of us to blame isabel shook her head it was not that it had nothing to do with you whatever you had been it would have made no difference you were not paul and that was all that mattered to me but mr seaton is a clever man and a very brilliant writer said lord wrexham generously though he took care to use the prefix mr that has nothing to do with it either he is clever i admit and kind and good but so are scores of other men i have known i cannot tell you why i love him so much i only know that to me he is the only man in the whole world and always will be my dear i hope you will be very happy with him and the kind voice trembled oh no there is no chance of that i have offended him past all forgiveness 
please don't think i have broken off my engagement with you because i am going to marry my old lover i shall not marry anybody but shall count as one of society's failures and people will pity me as they see me growing old by myself yet i shall not be altogether hard and bitter because i have tasted what love is like and having once tasted it even though I dashed the cup from my lips with my own hands, I can never drink of the any other. But, oh, Wrexham, how can I ever forgive myself for having hurt you? And then Isabel's torrent of words was stopped by a torrent of tears. Lord Wrexham rose from his chair and laid his hand on her bowed head. My dear, there must never be any question of forgiveness between you and me for i was yours to do what you liked with we both made a mistake you in thinking that you could be content with me and i in dreaming that i could make you happy but if ever you get tired of growing old alone remember that there are always one man's heart and hand waiting for you if you should choose to take them and before isabel could answer him he was gone always one man's heart and hand waiting for me even when i grow old and horrid she said to herself through her tears and he never remembered that there was venicure and coronet as well how good he is and what a gentleman during the next few weeks isabel devoted herself to the comforting of violet essendale who accepted the consolation with the egotism of youth never noticing that the heart of the comforter was even heavier than her own to violet the whole world was one huge background to bobby thistleton and all other persons and events mere incidents therein just as one sometimes sees prints of the duke of wellington with the battle of waterloo and the great exhibition of fifty one thrown in as small adjuncts to the distant view to add luster to the central figure we most of us have portraits of this kind hidden away somewhere in our hearts and to a person with a sense of humor it would be interesting to note the relative importance of the figures and their surroundings at first sight it seems funny that the university of oxford should have been founded by king alfred and enriched by the art and learning of the centuries merely to serve as a background for one particular graduate or that london should have out babylon babylon and become the greatest city in the world in order to supply the near distance for the portrait of one special woman but look at with the seeing eye and the understanding heart these things are not really funny at all any more than it is funny for the cluster of the Pallades to take up apparently less space than an ordinary wedding ring or for the great nebula in orion to seem more insignificant than the hand of a little child many times a day did isabel listen to a catalogue of bobby's excellencies and many times a day did she willingly say amen to them all for though violet was too young to think that any man mattered except bobby isabel was old enough to know that all men mattered because of paul so isabel went down to essadale court with her relations and there spent her days in talking about bobby and her nights in dreaming about paul there was one dreadful day at essadale when bobby's name appeared in the list of the wounded and a glorious one when england rang with his praises because the news came that he had received his wounds in going back under fire after he had himself reached a place of safety to rescue a fallen comrade then followed one of those wretched weeks when the days are punctuated by telegrams and bulletins instead of by meal-times and sun-risings 
and after a time there came one of those blessed seasons known to most of us when those who have come back from the gates of the grave combine the pathetic sacredness of the dead with the sweet familiarity of the living and we feel that we can never be angry with their faults nor irritated by their follies any more of course we can and are and shall be because there is much that in this human both in us and them but at first we do not believe it possible because there is also in both of us something that is divine it was in this same summer though rather earlier than the date of lord robert thistleton's going to india that the editor of the hours died and it was generally supposed in literary circles that the brilliant young writer paul seaton would take his place there were many who hoped for the post as it was one which united great political influence with considerable pecuniary advantage but there was no doubt in the minds of the initiated that seaton was the man for the place as in addition to his qualification as a man of letters his political views were almost identical with those of sir john shelford the proprietor of the paper early in june paul ran down home for a week to discuss with his people the change in his life and fortunes which appeared imminent for to paul himself as to the rest of his profession his selection as editor of the hours seemed a foregone conclusion there were other reasons besides the satisfying of his ambition that made paul greatly desire this appointment as the editor of the pendulum he was a poor man but as the editor of the hours he would be a rich one and he specially wanted money just then, as things were looking dark at the cottage at Claytford. For the last few months Joanna's health had been causing much anxiety to her parents, and Mrs. Seaton was not as strong as she had been, and it is in times of sickness and adversity that the pinch of poverty hurts most do you very much want to be the editor of the hours asked joanna one day yes answered paul more than i thought i should ever want anything again besides the pay which it would be an affliction to pretend that i am indifferent to it is a position of such tremendous influence the editor of the hours sways more opinions than i should like to say you are very fond of power paul said his mother paul smiled sadly it is all that is left to me you see and a man must have something to set his heart upon one morning when paul was the last to appear at the breakfast table joanna greeted him with the cry there is a letter for you from the office of the hours and i'm sure it is to say the appointment is yours Paul broke the seal and found it was a communication from John Shefford. It was kind enough letter, and full of regrets, but Sir John said that he could not consciously give a post of such far-reaching influence as that of editor of the hours to the man who wrote Shams and Shadows. Paul's political views, he added, were his own paul's literary style and knowledge all that could be desired nevertheless it would not be right for the man who had more to do perhaps with the forming of public opinion in england than any other to be held responsible for the unsound political teachings and the untrue philosophy of life which were found in the pages of shams and shadows sir john went on to speak in most flattering terms of some better thing and to say that such a book placed its author in the first rank of living men of letters but he continued you are too much a man of the world to need telling that litera scripta manet and that what a man has written 
he has written and he showed that because of shams and shadows paul could never realize his ambition and become the editor of the hours there was silence for a few moments after paul had ceased reading and mrs seaton began to cry quietly behind the coffee pot never mind mother he said manfully though his face was pale and tired it is no good making a trouble of things i don't deny that it is a disappointment but i can bear it all right if you won't let it make you unhappy but it is so hard sobbed mrs seaton that a man should be punished for a thing which he repented long ago but the world never forgives sighed the minister it is only god and our mothers that can do that i think that shefford is an old beast cried joanna warmly and i hope the new editor whoever he is will ruin the paper and cause all the shefford's to die in the workhouse paul tried to smile i cannot help seeing that shefford is right the editor of the hours must be above suspicion from a literary and political point of view or else the prestige of the paper will go down at once men in positions of great influence should never have anything to explain away well it seems to me a great shame repeated mrs seaton wiping her eyes that people should be punished for things after they have been sorry and have done all in their power to undo them still it is the way of the world replied paul when a wrong once has been done there is no undoing it but the punishment must be borne and the debt paid to the uttermost farthing it is a most disgusting piece of injustice exclaimed joanna paul pretended to go on with his breakfast no it isn't it is perfectly just for everything we do or leave undone we must sooner or later pay the bill and we should take this into account before we give our orders to fate i am now paying the bill for the writing of shams and shadows but you are sorry that the book ever was written aren't you asked joanna i should rather think i am far sorrier than any one else can ever be still i was a free agent and what i did i did with my eyes open and now that the bill has come in i mean to pay up like a man and not grumble it is only a fool that builds a tower or goes to war without counting the cost the cost is very heavy this time said mr seaton it is bad enough when a thing costs only money but it is worse when it costs other things shams and shadows has cost me a good deal more than money said paul i know it has replied his father and i hope that the debt would have been forgiven you paul smiled it was a vain hope nowadays to imagine that when we go down into egypt to buy corn the money will be put back into our sacks mouths sometimes it happens but only to fortune's favorites and i have never been one of those but if we are obliged to pay our bills we need not talk about them if you don't mind so the subject of conversation was changed but for the rest of the day joanna murmured to herself at intervals when nobody was listening old shefford is a beast when the minister and joanna had gone for their usual walk paul sat in the dining-room with his mother and her knitting and played with her ball of wool just as he had done when he was a little boy my dear where is isabel carnby now asked mrs seaton suddenly paul winced but he answered quietly she is still in town and is to be married to lord wrexham i believe at the end of this season i was very fond of isabel i know you were mother so was i what sort of a man is lord wrexham he is the best type of an english gentleman then you think he will make isabel happy said mrs seaton with a sigh of relief i did not say that 
replied Paul, dropping the ball of wool on the floor and diving after it. Do you think he will make her happy? persisted Mrs. Seaton. Paul was silent for a moment before he answered. Not as happy as I could have made her. He won't understand her, I suppose? No. Oh, Paul, why did you ever let her go? Because I was a poor man. If her marriage with me had involved no sacrifice on her part, I would have fought to the death rather than give her up, and I would have made her marry me in spite of everything, for I know I could have made her happy, but I could not force her to accept poverty, after I have seen that she hung back. But love matters more to a woman than anything else and she would rather be poor with the man she loves than be rich without him. I don't think that you and Joanna quite understand how much wealth and rank and things of that kind matter to a woman brought up as Isabel has been," said Paul. To you they are outside considerations which do not enter into your inner life at all, but to her they are the very air she breathes. Then do you mean to say that she could not be happy without them? No, I don't. I think, on the contrary, that it is not in the nature of such things to make Isabel happy, but she would have to resign them of her own free will. I could hardly force her to sacrifice them because I happen to think she could be happy without them especially as my own happiness depended upon her sacrifice. I see what you mean. Had she chosen poverty, you would have made it sweet to her, but you did not feel at liberty to force poverty upon her against her will. That was just it, continued Paul. As long as I saw that my love satisfied her, I knew that I held her happiness in the hollow of my hand and I was not afraid of poverty for herself or for me, but when I found that she was beginning to shrink from the hard life she had chosen, I felt it was but manly to let her go. Do you know I was afraid at one time that you had been hard on her, my dear? So I was at first, hard and bitter and proud, but when love comes on to the scene, Pride has to knuckle under, and hardness soon melts away. Just as first, I own, my pride held me back from her, because of some things she had said, but I soon forgave her, as I knew she was angry at the time, and did not mean them, and I should have forgiven her just the same, even if she had, he added, smiling at himself. Do you still care for her? asked Mrs. Seaton, knitting furiously in her excitement. Yes, nothing can ever alter that. Isabel will always be the one woman in the world to me. Then why, oh why, don't you go and tell her so, and beg her to come back to you and let bygones be bygones? I have told you, simply because she was rich and I was poor, if it had been the other way, I would have made her come back to me, and would have held her against the whole world. I could easily have put my own pride into my pocket, but her comfort was a different thing, and could not be so easily disposed of. But if she were rich and you were poor, you must remember also that she was a woman and you were a man and that the first advances should have come from you. The pride of womanhood is stronger instinct than the pride of poverty, persisted Mrs. Seaton, and then you must not forget shams and shadows. I am hardly likely to do so, replied Paul, rather bitterly. At present there seems no necessity for me to keep a bookmarker in that excellent work to prevent it from slipping from my memory altogether. But, my dear boy, do you mean to tell me that even after Shams and Shadows, with its cruel satire against a woman of fashion, was published, you expected Isabel to come back to you of her own accord? Yes, I did, 
Ah, oh, Paul, you did not understand women. Evidently not, worst luck for me. Mrs. Seaton's eyes filled with tears. I am afraid you have made a great mistake, my dear. I am always making them, and I find they come very expensive in the end, but I think I'll go out for a walk now. I've got such a thundering headache, said Paul, rising from his chair. I would, love. It will do you good. But when he reached the door, Paul turned back, and knelt down beside Mrs. Seaton's chair, and put his arms round her, as he used to do when he was a little child. I don't know how it is, he said, but everything I care for turns to disappointment, just as it seems to be within my grasp. I was so sure of myself, and meant to be such a brilliant success, and yet I have failed all along the line. Oh, mother, comfort me! And his mother comforted him as only his mother could. End of chapter 19 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 20 of Concerning Isabel Carnby This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Concerning Isabel Carnby by Ellen Thornycroft Fowler Chapter 20 Joanna There is many a cruel thorn, many a roaring lion, many a stone by footsteps worn on the road that leads to Zion. Early in October Isabel came back to town, and again took up her abode at her uncle's house in Prince's Gate. Lady Farley had been naturally much disappointed at the breaking off of her niece's engagement with Lord Wrexham, but she was too just not to see that, after all, Isabel was old enough to please herself, and that a woman on the threshold of the thirties was too old to be scolded. She was perfectly conscious that, from a social point of view, Isabel was fast writing herself down a failure, and therefore, for the first time in her life, Lady Farley did not disguise from her niece her high opinion of that niece's attractions. Like Horace Walpole, Lady Farley knew her world, and she had learned that it is when we fail that a little flattery is beneficial to us, also that we do not thank the friend who admires our excellencies, but for the stranger who openly exalts the strength of our weak places we reserve our undying devotion. So her ladyship was very complimentary to Isabel just then. The first Sunday afternoon after Isabel's return, Edgar Ford called at the Farleys, and after a few customary banalities, Miss Carnby inquired how the Setons were getting on. Not at all very well, I am sorry to say, replied Edgar. Joanna is very ill, and Mrs. Seton seems to be breaking up. Oh, I am so sorry. Do tell me all about them, begged Isabel. Poor Joanna has been ailing all summer, and now the doctors say that the only thing that could save her life would be a winter at Davos, and that she will run the greatest risk if she attempts to remain in England. Isabel's eyes filled with tears. Somehow lately all the guilt and the sunshine on things had vanished, and she kept seeing the underlying sadness of life whichever way she turned. Of course the Setons are not at all well off, continued Edgar, and a winter abroad is always a costly business for any one. But Paul, I believe, is ready to defray all Joanna's expenses, so that no burden shall fall upon his father. The difficulty, however, is that there is no one to go with her, and she is far too delicate to go alone. That is a serious difficulty, said Lady Farley. 
they cannot find any one who happens to be going and who would take charge of her besides it would be hard for the poor girl to go out perhaps to die with strangers and the journey would kill mr or mrs seaton right out if they could afford it couldn't her brother take her lady farley suggested edgar shook his head he could not possibly spare the time he is such an unselfish fellow that he would gladly go with joanna if it could be managed and take every care of her but he could not leave london for several months without resigning his appointment as editor of the pendulum and if he did that he could not afford to pay even joanna's expenses much less his own then lady farley being tired of the setons as a subject of conversation began to talk about other things while isabel dispensed the tea which had just been brought in i'm afraid i must be off edgar said at last for i am going to the service at st james hall to-night and it is impossible to get a seat unless one is there half an hour before time i have never been said isabel i should like to go and see what it is like she felt great leanings towards anything connected with methodism just then not from any special sympathy with the teachings of john wesley but simply because methodism like yellow roses reminded her of paul then come with me now i will take great care of her lady farley and bring her back safe and sound yes go my dear said her ladyship kindly if you think it will interest you lady farley regarded religious services as she regarded love affairs namely as seemly diversions pour passer le temps so isabel ran upstairs to put on what women call her things and then she and edgar repaired to st james hall when they arrived there the hall was practically full though it was a good half hour before the beginning of the service but the congregation kept streaming in and by seven o'clock every corner was densely packed and people were standing in the doorways and the passages this crowded audience looks more like a political meeting than a religious service whispered isabel to edgar with a surprise which we all feel when god for the time being occupies public attention to the exclusion of man and heaven instead of earth becomes a topic of the hour it is a wonderful sight edgar whispered back there is nothing like it in london the whole scene stirred isabel strangely not only was the crowd very large but it consisted chiefly of men a great number of them were soldiers in their scarlet uniforms and almost all of them were counted among those poor who whom it had been promised that the gospel shall be preached these were none of the well-to-do people who go to church or chapel as they go to court because it is the correct thing to pay homage to the heavenly as to the earthly sovereign but working men whose hearts as well as whose hands had been scarred and hardened by the ceaseless grind of poverty and toil on the platform behind the minister's desk sat a row of sweet-faced sisters of the poor in their plain black gowns and long gray veils while again behind them came the band and a crowd of workers filling the enormous platform of st james hall up to the roof a less emotional woman than isabel carnby would have been thrilled at the sound of a hymn sung by so vast a concourse of people and at the sight of so large a number gathered together with one accord in one place and when the time for the sermon came and the preacher showed forth some of the sorrows of the world and echoed his great cry for help she felt that there was no resisting that appeal until now she had been one of the careless daughters one of the women that are at ease and she had been deaf to the weeping and the wailing inside the prison walls of poverty but at least her ears had been opened 
and she had heard the sorrowful sighing of the prisoners appointed to die, and she felt she must be up and doing, and must take her part in stemming the torrent of the world's great flood of tears. She and Edgar said little on their way home, and each understood that the heart of the other was too full for speech. The next day Isabel wrote the following letter. My dear Miss Seaton, I am so dreadfully sorry to hear from Mr. Ford that Joanna is ill. I cannot tell you unhappy it has made me, but I think you will understand without being told. I am full of hope that a winter at Davos will set her right again, as I have known it works such wonderful cures. But I hear your difficulty is that she can find nobody to accompany her and therefore I am writing to ask if I may offer my services. I would promise to take every care of her, and my maid, who is an experienced nurse as well as a most faithful old servant, would look after us both. I could be ready to start in a fortnight from now, and could arrange to stay as far into the spring as the doctors thought desirable on Joanna's account. Yours lovingly, Isabel Carnby. This letter brought great joy to the little home at Chaford. Mrs. Seaton's first impulse was to close with Isabel's offer at once, as to ensure a chance of recovery for Joanna, but she felt that anything connected with Isabel was Paul's business, and that therefore she could settle nothing without consulting him. She wrote a loving letter to Isabel telling the latter how grateful both Joanna and her parents were for this great kindness, but that Paul was undertaking the entire management of his sister's journey, so that final arrangement must rest with him. Then Mrs. Seaton forwarded Isabel's letter to Paul, bidding him deal with it as he thought best. I am not doing this in order to bring Paul and Isabel together again, she said to herself but entirely on Joanna's account. I should have done just the same had Miss Delicott made the offer instead of Isabel, for it clearly Paul's duty to make all the arrangements he can for his sister's comfort. It is purely a matter of business. Then a smile stole round the corners of her mouth as she added, It will all come right again as soon as they see each other, and my boy will be happy as he deserves to be. For Paul's mother had heard of the breaking off of the Wexram engagement, and had drawn her own conclusions. A day or two after this, Isabel received a letter from Paul. My dear Miss Carnby, my mother has forwarded to me your most kind and generous offer of help to us in our present difficulty as it is I who am taking the responsibility of Joanna's illness. I feel that we cannot refuse this offer without due consideration, because the plan that you propose would, would prove such an inestimable benefit to my sister, nor can we, on the other hand, accept it without due consideration, because it would be a most serious undertaking for you. Therefore, if you will allow me, I will call upon you tomorrow afternoon to discuss the matter more fully than we can do by letter. Yours gratefully, Paul Seaton. As Paul wrote above, he laughed at his own folly. What a fool I am, he said to himself. Of course I could manage it perfectly by writing, if I wanted to do so, but I am as excited as a boy of twenty at the mere idea of seeing her face and hearing her voice again. I wonder if Lord Wrexham minded being thrown over by her as much as I did. If so, I pity him with all my heart. So Paul Seaton and Isabel Carnby saw each other face to face once more. Because they were well-bred people, and moreover, a man and woman of the world, they met apparently with perfect ease and without any disquieting emotion, although Paul's heart beat like a regimental drum all the time, and Isabel felt if a little bird were fluttering in the middle of her throat. A casual observer would have thought that they were ordinary acquaintances 
who had seen each other the day before, and the only difference that the most experienced eye could have detected was that they were neither quite as clever as usual. They did not seem to look at one another with any special attention, and yet in the first ten seconds that they were together Paul knew that Lizabel was thinner than of old, and that there had come a tired look into the blue eyes, and Isabel perceived that there were many grey hairs round Paul's temples, and that she and time together had managed to plough some deep furrows across his forehead. "'How do you do?' began Isabel, taking a shade faster than her wont. "'It is very good of such a busy man to spare the time to come and see me.' "'It is very good of you to let me come,' replied Paul. "'But it is so much easier to talk over plans than to write about them. "'Then let us get to business at once,' suggested Isabel hurriedly, "'as I dare say you have not much time to spare.' "'She really meant that she had not much courage to spare, "'but we so rarely say what we actually mean. "'And why should we? "'The understanding people know without our saying, and it doesn't matter whether the stupid ones know or not. Certainly, agreed Paul, who happened to be one of the most understanding people. I know it is very bad manners to be in a hurry, but unfortunately I nearly always am. I believe my health will be permanently impaired by the scalding state in which I always have to swallow cups of tea during afternoon calls. Long and bitter experience has taught me that unless you can fly before you hear the distant rattle of the teacups, you are lost. If once tea is within earshot, escape becomes impossible till the cup is drained to the dregs. If you leave in the interval between the sound of tea and its outpouring, you somehow cast a slur upon the quickness of your hostess's servant. Paul knew perfectly well about that little bird fluttering in Isabel's throat, and he talked on at random in order to give her time to recover herself. She laughed. Well, I am glad that the tea is here now, so that you can have a cup at once and drink it at your leisure. Thank you. And now about Joanna. I cannot tell you how grateful I am to you for your most kind suggestion. But before we go into that, I want you to consider what it will mean to you. At present I think you have no idea of the sacrifice which it will involve on your part. I don't mind that. The greater the sacrifice, the better it will be for me. You see, I have done nothing but help myself for thirty years, and now I think it is time I began to help other people. But this is such a big beginning, persisted Paul. It means shutting yourself up for six months in an atmosphere of sickness and possibly death. And this is a tremendous undertaking for any woman, especially for one who has hitherto had all the wheels of life oiled for her. But think of Joanna. I am trying not to think of her till I have done thinking of you. Of course my first impulse was to thank you on my knees for thus coming to our help, but you must be considered as well as Joanna, and I am not sure that I should be justified in letting you make so great a sacrifice for any one who has after all no claim upon you. And Paul got up from his seat and looked out of the window so that Isabel might not see his face. Isabel's eyes grew wistful. Please don't stop me now. At last I'm trying to be good. Heaven forbid! But the path of duty is not easy walking, and I would carry you over the rough places if I could. But the way is thorny and your feet are very tender, replied Paul gently. Nevertheless, I am going, and I cannot help you, much as I should wish it. If Joanna became much worse, I should come out to her once, but I could not afford the time to stay with her long, as the unavoidable expenses of her illness will make me specially busy all this winter. 
nevertheless i am going repeated isabel you have definitely made up your mind yes what does lady farley say about it asked paul she says i am old enough and wise enough to please myself and to know my own business best then if your decision is now made and my words are powerless to affect you one way or another i may tell you what this act of yours means to me and my people it will probably be the saving of joanna's life at any rate it is giving her the one chance she has of recovery and without you this one chance would have denied her after i told you this all expressions of gratitude will be superfluous i think yes please don't thank me i don't want to be thanked said isabel breathlessly let us make all the necessary arrangements for joanna and i ought to be starting soon if this foggy weather continues so paul and isabel set to work to plan poor joanna's exodus out of england before the winter actually set in and three weeks after this interview isabel and joanna went out to davis platz together with the former's fateful old nurse to take care of and look after them the new life was very interesting to isabel she had hitherto lived in a world where sickness and death were put out of sight and forgotten as far as possible but now she was suddenly plunged into the midst of society of people who were all either ill or anxious but these bore it bravely and put on a cheerful courage and if she had not known that all was not well with them she would have found them pretty much the same as happier folks joanna specially interested isabel and the two women were drawn very close together neither had ever had a sister and a woman who has never had a sister has missed something which can never be made up to her in this world women who have no sisters share their confidences with their friends or their sisters-in-law just as men who have no legs walk about on cork or wooden ones but perfect satisfaction is not found in makeshifts however anything is better than nothing so isabel and joanna found much pleasure in each other's society joanna did not talk much about herself but when she did it was with perfect ease and cheerfulness she had brought up in a circle where the things which are seen and temporal are not more familiar or real than the things which are unseen and eternal and this familiarity and sense of nearness is of good comfort to much souls as feel forebodings of the chill and the darkness of the great shadow i minded dreadfully being ill at first she said one day to isabel as they had been some weeks together and their friendship was established i had meant to do so much work for god in my own little world i was really doing it it seemed rather hard to be suddenly put on the shelf as of no further use i was actually getting so conceited that i thought none of the classes or meetings in chaford would get on properly without me and yet my mother says in her last letter that my bible class has increased in numbers since miss dalicott became leader in my place while dorcas meeting is doing more work than ever as for my district alice martin took it and the people simply adore her she is so sweet and pretty and speak to them so beautifully so the lord can carry on his work without my help though at one time i doubted it and joanna laughed i did not know that alice was good at work of that kind she is she is simply splendid in the first place she is very pretty and that has a tremendous influence it would take me twenty visits to the poor to win as much love as she gains in one but i did not know she was so religious she was always good and amiable replied joanna even when she was quite a child but lately she has been a great deal under edgar ford's influence and has 
learned from him the importance of our responsibility to the poor she will do more good in my district than i have ever done i suppose the world could do without any of us said isabel sadly none of us are indispensable to anything or anybody joanna shook her head the world might but god couldn't oh you said that he could oh no i didn't i said that he could carry on his work without us which is quite a different thing isabel looked puzzled what is the difference don't you see it is like this when i was a little girl father always allowed me to open his letters with a small paper knife i used to love doing it i felt so important and i imagined that if it hadn't been for me father's letters would have permanently remained unopened i used to say nearly every day you couldn't do without me could you father and he always answered no of course father could have opened all his letters well enough without my help but he couldn't have done without me all the same how good are you are dear joanna indeed i am not i only wish i were but i am ill and when one is ill one has plenty of time to think and i have come to the conclusion that god knows his own business best and that he must often smile at us tenderly when he sees us so ready to help him with our advice he knows everything and he says that certain things will be best for us we know next to our nothing and yet like beatrice we are at him upon our knees every morning and evening to prove to him that he is mistaken and that we know better he really is rather humorous then you have learnt to leave everything to him and not to worry i hope i have replied joanna i don't deny that it has been a difficult lesson at one time like everybody else i thought that i knew better than god and i tried my utmost to teach him what was the right thing for me and for methodism and for christianity at large and i confess that i was grieved not to say reproachful for he did not follow my advice but now i just sit still and let him take all the responsibility it must be very restful sighed isabel it is if you went on a long voyage it would be very tired to spend all your time in trying to steer the ship by beating against the bulwarks with your hands and very ineffectual and foolish then why behave then absurdly on the voyage of life for a pilot never makes mistakes it was not till the two friends became very intimate that they began to talk about paul though they both spent much time in thinking about him but at last even that barrier of reserve gave way as most barriers do if only a tete a tete be long enough and paul's sister soon discovered that isabel still loved paul my dear why don't you just ask him to come back to you asked joanna abruptly oh i couldn't i should be ashamed after the way i have treated him then do you mean to let your pride spoil both your life and his isabel did not answer and joanna continued when people come to where i am now they look at life so differently from how they used to look when the end of the road was not in sight and they see that things which once seemed important are trivial and the things which once seemed trivial are the only things that matter when you stand where i am standing you won't care a scrap whether your pride and your self-respect receive their due but you will care indefinitely whether you and Paul are together, or whether you will have to go down into the dark valley all alone. Isabel began to cry quietly. Don't cry, Isabel. I am so sorry that I have upset you, and I hate to talk in this horrid, depressing way. But I felt I must tell you just once that, when the end comes, you will find that nothing really matters except the love of god and our love for each other 
and I want you to realize this before it is too late. Isabel came and knelt down by Joanna's sofa. Do you think that Paul could forgive me? she asked. I should think so. There is nothing that real love cannot forgive, and I am sure that Paul really loved you. How do you know so much about love, Joanna? I can't tell. I suppose every woman knows all about it, whether she has tasted it or not. That is one of the things that I used to think I could teach the Lord. I imagined that it was best for me, and for every other woman, to live the ordinary woman's happy life. But God knew better, and so love passed me by. Poor Joanna! Joanna rested her cheek against Isabel's. You need not pity me now, dear. I have long ceased to mind, though I did dreadfully at one time. But when God withholds a thing from us, he always gives us something better in its place. It is hard, I admit, to stand alone on Pisgah, and to see the others going on without us into the promised land. But Pisgah and its disappointment are forgotten, after we have stood for a moment upon the Mount of Transfiguration, and have caught glimpses of the glory which shall be revealed. After a moment's silence, Isabel said softly, I don't believe there ever was anybody so good as you and Paul. Paul is a good man. No one but father and mother and I quite know how good I think. I do, whispered Isabel. Of course he gets angry sometimes, continued Joanna, and is stern and self-willed and masterful, but he is very gentle and tender underneath and very unselfish. There is only one thing he has ever done which has really grieved me, and which seemed to me to be inconsistent with the rest of his character. But I suppose when men are very unhappy and bitter they do things for which they are hardly accountable. Still I wish Paul had not written Shams and Shadows. He never did write it, cried Isabel looking up through her tears. He was far too good and true and noble to write such a nasty, sneering book as that. He could not have done it if he tried. Then if Paul didn't write it, who did? I did, replied Isabel with a sob. I was angry with myself and therefore with everything else, and I wrote that horrid book in a flit of temper, and when I saw how people hated it, I was ashamed and felt I could not bear the disgrace of being known as its author, and then Paul saved me from the consequence of my own folly, and bore the punishment instead of me. End of chapter 20 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C.